Thank you for joining everybody. I want to encourage you really quickly that as a Christian, you are a completely forgiven person in God's sight. That's something we call the positional reality of the believer, is that positionally God sees you as the righteousness of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says that our sins were put on Jesus on the cross. All of our sins, everything you've ever done, past, present, or future, was put on Jesus. And his righteousness, his perfection, was given to us. So we are now the righteousness of God in him. In Hebrews 10.14, it says, For by one offering, when he died on the cross, he has perfected, past tense, so it's already done. He has perfected forever, for all time, them that are sanctified. As a true believer in Jesus Christ, as a Christian, you are already perfected in Christ. And it says in verse 17, Hebrews 10, 17, And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. He's not up there with a running tally like, Oh, you did this today and yesterday. and No, he has already forgiven you. That's something we call our positional reality in Christ. Your positional reality and your daily walk may not always align. They should, and as you grow and mature in Christ, they will become more and more, more aligned. Um, but when God sees you, he's seeing the righteousness of Christ. It doesn't mean that he's not aware of your sins. It doesn't mean that they don't need to be dealt with and that there aren't consequences for them. There, cer there certainly is. But as an encouragement, know that God has already forgiven you everything. In, second, um, sorry, in Colossians 2.13, it says that God has forgiven us all sins, all sins, all trespasses. Um, all means all. It means past, present, and future. Your past, your past sins, present sins, and future sins are already forgiven. Now, that doesn't mean you have the license to go out and sin. You say, oh, great, I'm forgiven. I get to go do what I want now. If that is your perspective, you do not understand grace. If you've truly understood the, the, the grace of God, you're not going to walk away thinking, oh, great, I get to go sin. You're going to be ecstatic and thankful to God and live for him, right? That's, that just means if you don't understand this, you need to understand grace. God's grace is his goodness, and the goodness of God calls men to repentance, to change. That's, Rome, that's Romans 2, 4. God's grace should be something that transforms you and not something that you use as a license to go off and sin. That's Romans 6, 1, uh, where Paul says people are slandering him by saying that's what he preaches. It's not. God's grace is not to go off and do what you want. God's grace is to forgive and save and transform you. Now, we do mess up every day. Every believer at some point in, in thought, word, or deed is going to mess up and going to sin in some way. You're probably not even aware of it. It could be bitterness, pride, even some little subtle thing in your heart that you're not aware of. We all make many mistakes, things we're not even, like I said, not even aware of, things we've forgotten about. Um, and God's forgiven. You are a forgiven person. Don't think that he's gonna, you're going to show up one day and he's like, oh, you have these sins you didn't apologize for. <laughs> no, he has already forgiven you. He has already forgiven you all sins, Colossians 2.13. Um, and Hebrews 1.3 says that when he had by himself, Jesus by himself, purged our sins, past tense, it's already done. As a believer, you are a completely forgiven person. Now, it says uh, two passages I want to go through quickly on this note. In Romans 8, 1, it says, There is now therefore no condemnation to those which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And you see that phrase again in verse 4, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So people say, yeah, if you're walking after the Spirit and righteousness, there's no condemnation. But if you walk after the flesh, there will be condemnation. And that's not at all what it's saying. Because you get to verse 9, don't just stop reading one verse. <laughs> Read the entire passage, take it in context. In Romans 8 verse 9, it says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So as a believer, the Spirit of God dwelling in you, God sees you as walking in the Spirit. And every believer has the Holy Spirit. It says, now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Every single believer in Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, um, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be the Spirit of God dwells in you. So Romans 8 verses 1 to 13 is not a passage about your daily walk. It's a passage about your positional reality in Christ. As a Christian with the Spirit in you, you are not walking after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And there's no condemnation for you because you are a completely forgiven person. You are completely forgiven. If you're outside of Christ, then you are in the flesh. And that there is condemnation. That's why people outside of Jesus end up in hell. It says in uh, Romans 8, 13, For if you live after the flesh, which is those outside of Christ, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And so people say again, like, aha, 
if you don't put the flesh to death, you'll still go to hell. No. Galatians 5, 24 and 25 says, they that are Christ's have crucified, past tense. It doesn't say they need to crucify. It says they have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Why? Because as soon as you're in Christ, you are now dead to who you were, dead to the law, dead to sin. That's Romans 6, uh, Romans 7, 1 to 4, same thing. The law that like, the sin has no power over you because you're now a new creation. You're washed in the uh, uh, Titus 3, 5. You begin the wash of regeneration of the Holy Spirit. You're clean. You're a regenerate person. You have a new heart. That's why as a believer, when you sin, you feel that turmoil in you. Like, oh, I should not have done that because you've just done something that violated the new nature that God has put within you. And the Holy Spirit's there to help you and to guide. Like you, you, that, that's one of the signs that you're saved is that you, you can't just go off and do all these sins and be totally cool with it. If you can numb yourself to it, but you're always going to know that it's wrong. It's, it's not going to vibe with the new spirit that God's given you. And it says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. That's our calling. Now that we're saved and forgiven and redeemed and regenerated with the spirit, sealed with the spirit till the day of redemption, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, Ephesians 4, 30. Um, we are now to walk after that, to grow in Christ. That's our daily walk. That's progressive sanctification. That's the walk where we're, where we're growing, becoming more and more like Jesus. Um, and one more passage I want to cover on this quickly. Sorry, it's really late and I really need to get to bed because I have a big trip tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I wanted to get this done. In 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, people will say, if you don't confess your sins, you'll have unforgiven sin, and then you can't be cleansed, and you end up in hell, or on thin ice. <laughs> and that's not what 1 John is talking about. First, okay, in the early church, there was something called Gnosticism, which was a kind of kind of like a, like a Greek um, philosophy, and they taught a lot of weird things. They taught that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. They taught there is no such thing as sin, that the physical world is bad, the spiritual world is evil, and when you die, you won't get a new body, you'll just be this spirit floating around. And they, they taught some really weird ideas. And these ideas in the first century church were starting to infiltrate the church and mess with people's ideas and the theology. And so 1 John 1 is, is written to address um, this Gnostic sort of infiltration. In one chapter 1, verse 1, it says that they saw Jesus with their eyes and touched him with their hands. It's a really weird thing to say to a bunch of believers, unless you realize that John is addressing Gnostics who said that Jesus didn't come in a body. In verse 8, it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. It's a weird thing to say to Christians, unless you realize that Gnostics were saying there's no such thing as sin. And so John's saying you have to acknowledge your sin. If you don't have sin, then you have no need of a savior. So in order for Jesus to be your savior, you have to recognize I am born with a sinful nature and by default I have sinned many, countless times, more than you're aware of, more than you want to know. And those sins are what separate you from God. So you have to acknowledge your sin and therefore your need of a savior before you can, before you can ask Jesus to save you. It says in verse 9 then, if we confess our sins and acknowledge our position, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All. Why does it say all? Because as a Christian, you are a completely forgiven person. Past, present, and future are included in the word all. And again, going back to Colossians 2.13, um, sorry, um, he has quickened us or made us alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. All trespasses. You are a completely forgiven person in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, again, that, that our sins were put on him, his righteousness was given to us. If we still have sin, then that transfer wasn't complete. We're a forgiven, per, uh, forgiven people. Again, that doesn't mean you go off and do what you want. If that's your mentality, you're either extremely deceived and you need to get your heart straight with God, or or you're, you genuinely, genuinely didn't hear and understand the gospel. Because the, God, the goodness of God calls you to repent, to turn from that. And when you understand and experience his grace, you've understood and experienced his goodness. And that's going to transform your heart. And if you sin, if you struggle with something, if you make a mistake, or if you have a stupid moment or whatever, God has already forgiven you. Okay, I can forgive my kids before they ask for forgiveness. They still should to, to clear the, the air and to keep our relationship fresh and to, to work on things. Um, but also understand that God's not up there ready to turn away on you. You are already forgiven. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Romans 8, 39. Nothing in all creation, even, even if you commit sin, is not going to separate you from his love. It might bring on consequences. It can frustrate or, or grieve God. It can do a whole lot of things. 
It can cost, uh, cost you a lot of things in this life, but God's love for you as his child still remains. And he wants to work with that. He wants to forgive you and to, and to build you up and, and to get you back on your feet. So I hope this is an encouragement to you. As a believer, you are completely forgiven. Okay, go read Hebrews 10, 14, Colossians 2, 13, 1 John 1, 9, uh, Romans 8, uh, verses 1 and 9 are the two key parts of that passage. Um, Hebrews 10, 17, there's a whole bunch of verses on this you can go to, but I pray this is an encouragement to you guys. Thank you very much for watching. I pray God blesses you and have a great week. Thank you.